Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this lovely lecture on theory of flight. Uh, my name is Ben. I've been a pilot for, I don't know, I don't remember, tw uh, 12 years, something like that. Um, I've not been as active as I've been last few years, but never mind. Um, just to gauge the people here tonight, are they all paraglider pilots or do we have hang glider pilots as well? I'm a hang glider pilot. Okay. And are you, have, you, have you done all your hours and you're ready to just sign off or you're halfway through your hours? And you need qualified. Uh, you see, I've seen a car, look. You're not too late. <laughs> Another fellow Frenchman. Bonsoir. <laughs> okay, so um, this is the last lecture. <clears throat> in a three-part lecture from uh, you had, uh, weather, air low, and then this one. Um, it's not as dry as air low. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit dry, but not as dry. Uh, there's about 50-odd slides, um, so it's a bit less than two hours, but to be honest, it's the questions. People tend to have a lot of questions in, that le in this lecture. So, what are we, so if you have any questions during the lecture, just ask me, and then we'll try to sort it out and solve it. Yep. Um, okay, so what are we going to talk about tonight? We're going to cover how a wing creates lift, it's fair enough. Um, some of the uh, terms you can come across. Um, what's the stall? We're going to talk about stability, uh, glide and goal, um, ballast used. Um, that's more for sailplane, but it is in, in the exam. So. Um, forces that are apply to the gliders, the different type of drags, um, talk about the polars, and then at the end there's a short um, slides on instruments. Okay, Bernoulli theorem, nice my spelling, I thought I corrected that, but obviously that's not the latest version. Um, so there's a very basic principle that if you increase an airflow over a surface, the pressure on that surface decrease. Does that make sense? Yeah, so if you've got, if you've got a surface like that and you've got an airflow, it goes over. And if you accelerate that airflow, the pressure which is measured here on that surface will decrease. So there's nice little diagrams like that. Um, so if you measure the pressure along the path of the airflow, you decrease the pressure, okay, as it accelerates. I mean, you just use this to actually accelerate the, uh, the airflow. Well, you encounter that when you're on the top of the hill, yeah? You use that naturally when you're on top of the hill, where at, when you're at the top of the hill, the airflow is accelerated, so you tend to go down here to take off, don't you? <laughs> uh, and then when you go there, oh, I'm going backwards, <laughs> anyway. Um, so when the airflow is accelerated by this uh, reducing of the, uh, of the space the airflow can go through, the pressure measured here will go down. Okay? Sometimes people explain that the wrong way and it's just, just the pressure goes down, but if you actually face the airflow, the pressure goes up. That makes sense? Yeah? So if you face the airflow, you'll feel it's stronger. But if you are lying down with your mouth open, you'll feel the air coming out of your mouth, if that makes sense. Yeah? Yeah, just try it. You know, I've just th thought about that and I've never tried it. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to try it. The problem you have is you've got, uh, you got the skin effect, so the, the airflow along the, uh, the, the grass will be very, very slow, though. So it's not, yeah, it might not work as, as well as that. Okay, so, um, so when you, do, when you, you create a, an airfoil, you try to, um, to use this phenomenon to create some, um, some lift. So, um, the airfoil, what it does to the airflow is deform the airflow to accelerate it at the top and slow it down at the, top, at the bottom. And that creates a different of pr difference of pressure. So you got reduced pressure at the top and increased pressure at the bottom. The airflow slows down underneath, so that increases the pressure. And the airflow accelerates at the top. You've got signal here. Yeah. <laughs> I've never had any signal here ever. <laughs> in 12 years I've been here, I've never had a signal. Um, 
and you uh, because the airflow accelerated top uh, it decreased the pressure you can see that because if you if you take those uh, lines which are um, the, the timeline they're coming so the airflow is coming they all together leading the wing you can see that the blue one is accelerated comes out of the back of the wing before the bottom one yeah all make sense all clear So if you've got your airflow coming over there, just repeat what I've just told you. Um, you've got decreased pressure at the top, increased pressure at the bottom. And the effect is about one third, two third. So two third of the, uh, of the, of the depression is created at the top and one third of the increased pressure is created at the bottom. So it's much more efficient at the top than at the bottom. Hence the single skin gliders you see nowadays. Have you seen those? Yeah, they don't have it in your but they don't have any bottom surface and they still fly. Um, because there is enough force is created by the top surface to actually sustain flight. Important term you'll come across, which is center of pressure. So if you take all those pressures, yeah, and you add them all up, there's one point in that wing, a theoretical point where the pressure will be applied. Okay? And that's the center of pressure. And from that center of pressure, all the forces created will go from that center of pressure and it will be a vector that will be the resultant of all the forces. So if you add up all the forces, then you, you end up with the vector at the center of pressure. We'll come back to it anyway, there's more explanation further on. Okay. The chord line and angle of attack. The chord line. Does anyone who knows what it is? Yeah, you all, 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 you should have come across it in your everyday um, flying. Uh, the chord line is an imaginary line that goes from the uh, trailing edge, center of the trailing edge, to the center of the leading edge, to the center of the trailing edge. Okay. I think in the exam they got a very weird definition. If I remember well, it's very very strange, but you will. If you, if you read it properly, you will find it's equivalent to that, but it's very strange. I've never seen it everywhere else. I've looked on the web and I don't know where they, they've pulled it from. I've read quite a few books. I've never come across that definition, but I can't remember where it is. But if you, if you read all the others, it just makes no sense. So the only one that kind of like makes sense is that one's left. Yeah. Um, the angle of attack. So how do you def define the angle of attack? Anybody? What does it say there? Well, it's the difference between the chord line and where the air is going. What is the angle between, between the chord line and the direction of the airflow? Okay. It's quite an important concept because, um, especially for stalling, comes, comes along very important. It's very important to understand the angle of attack. Um, so if your airflow, if your, if your wings stay the same but your airflow moves up and down, then your angle of attack will change. Okay. So you could be flying nicely along and the airflow that hitting your wing changes, not you actively doing anything to your wing, could change and suddenly you, start, you can stall without doing anything, especially when you go through thermal because you've got rising air and falling air. Yeah. So when you come out of a thermal, you're hitting falling air, so the, angle of that, the, the direction of the airflow tends to go down. So when you come through it, you tend to stall there, don't you? So just be aware of this kind of thing. Okay, <clears throat> so it's very important for the, um, the stall. When the angle of attack becomes too high, it opens, 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 at some point becomes so high that the airflow that goes over the wing can't stick to the wing. There isn't that effect of accelerating the air nicely in the laminar effect. That doesn't happen anymore. It starts from the, from the back of the, uh, of the wing and it usually starts delaminating at the back, so you start to have turbulence is there and then more and it moves forward, 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 forward to such and you reach a point where there's no forces anymore and your, your wing can't fly. Now if all that, at no point we've talked about speed. Yeah? Stall has got nof nothing to do with speed. It's all about the angle of attack. 
It only comes with speed with our gliders because we can't change the angle of attack. We've got no control to go forward or backward, you know, to pitch or uh, less pitch or more pitch. But it's all to do with the angle of attack. So um, you can stall acro, acro plane. So if you go like that, you can stall this uh, plane at full speed. And that's what they do in acro all the time. They fly along at 100 and something miles an hour and they, they pull the rudder, you know, they pull really hard. And what it does is it does that and dynamically stall. And then they start, and then they start doing their acro. The wings are stalled and they are at full, at full speed. That makes sense? Yeah? On our, on our aircraft, usually when we start stalling, we'll feel it because it all gets mushy and horrible. And so if you, if you know your wings, put your hands back up, which is the equivalent of reducing your angle of attack again. Hmm? Paraglider is a bit weird because there is obviously a direct relationship between angle of attack and, and speed. But you could, in theory, stall them. I mean, they do it in acro as well. To be honest, I think they're still, they, they will do it with modern wings. You know, they put a lot of brakes and the wing will still say, stay nicely shaped. And then they'll just start doing uh, um, dynamic stalls. Um, so, as I explained earlier on, as the angle of attack increases, the, uh, you create turbulence in the top surface, increase the drag, start losing your lift. Um, and as your angle of attack increases, you, your center of pressure keeps moving forward and forward and forward. So if you go back here, as your angle of attack increases, so if your airflow starts to go more and more that way, then your center of pressure tends to move more and more and more and more forward. Okay? Okay, so far? Exciting, isn't it? <laughs> okay, lift and drag. Um, okay, the wing, well, if you take the aircraft, say it's an aircraft, um, it's no different from any other physical object and it's, it's always in balance, okay? And what you have is you have your wing that creates lift and by creating lift, it creates drag. Okay, um, and the way the forces are applied is that your uh, drag is directed along the airflow and your lift is perpendicular to your airflow. Okay, and those forces with your weight, the weight is not there, but it should be the weight of the glider, of the, of the um, aircraft, there will be another figure later, later on. But once you add the weight, all those forces should be null. Because otherwise you'll be going up or you'll be going down faster. <clears throat> or if there's so much drag, then you'll be going backwards, which never happens. <laughs> so as you, as you fly through the air, the wing to create lift also creates drag. There's no, there, unfortunately, there's no way around it. You can't get, what's the expression again? Free beer. No, well, yeah, you can't get free beer. <laughs> I guess it's in a beer for free. Um, and one of the, uh, one of the drag comes from the difference of, pre difference of pressure between the two surfaces. So what you end up is, um, you got, you got your top wing and your bottom wing there, okay? Bottom, top surface, bottom surface. And as we explained earlier on, you've got low pressure at the top, high pressure at the bottom. And the air, the air wants to try to fly, to go from one high pressure to the low pressure. Make sense? Yep. And by doing so, when you reach the tip, the air will go up to the high pressure. But you're also moving forward, aren't you, through the air. So you've got this air coming up there, but and that's why, that's why not very good aircraft, really. <laughs> we can do amazing things with them, but they're not very efficient. Um, just a, a basic hang glider is much, much more efficient aircraft than ours. So that's the engine's drag. What was our drag do you know of? Uh, parasitic. Okay. Yeah, parasitic drag. 
So what's the difference between the two? Yes, parasitic drag increases with speed. And what, what, what is creating by the, by, what does create the, uh, the drag? Increased friction. Yeah, friction is one. Yeah, it's basically the object flying through the air offers a resistance to the air and that creates drag. Anything you put through the air will create a resistance and that's your parasitic drag. So that's shown by that basically. You put a flat surface and you put some kind of airflow in front of it, it will create a force that will be able to lift a huge weight. <laughs> okay? And so somebody talked about the, the friction drag, but the other one, the first one, is the form drag. And that's due to the shape that the thing's facing, and the friction drag is due to the air traveling against it along the. Uh, along the surface of the object. How can we reduce the form drag? Yeah, but in general, you can just change the shape to make it a bit more, yeah, streamline. You can streamline the thing. So if you, if you take that section of um, piece of material, you can wrap it around something, keep that same section, same section, but if you streamline it, then you create a lot less drag. Yeah. Um, what other way do they do on, on, gli on pack gliders to reduce the, the drag? You can't really, well, you can get the uh, pod harness. Less line. Less line. And that was a massive, in the, in the 2000s, there was a massive jump in performance when they introduced, do you know which technology they introduced? That reduced the line number of lines. It's V ribs. Before that, they had lines for each cell, and then they introduced the V ribs, where you share one one line per two cells. So from one, from one day to the next, they reduced the the, the the drag by two, which is which is huge. And that's when really paraglider jumped in performance tremendously, and that's why they're going to the two, three, and two liners now. Yeah. You can also bring the pilots back towards the, um, the wing to reduce the length of the lines. So that introduces stability issues and stuff like that. Why would that reduce the, uh, the, the drag then by bringing the pilot closer? To the it's just the number of lines you have. Oh, the, right. the, the, the distance, the shorter lines. If you bring the pilot here, yeah. then you reduce your, the length of your lines, don't you? And then that's less facing the airflow. So why, when you have a high, high aspect glider, does it become more difficult to fly? Why does it become more difficult to fly? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's due to the uh, aeroelasticity of the paraglider. Because we, the, 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 the aircraft we fly is a bit crazy, it's floppy. Okay. So it's a very long, when you've got high aspect ratio, it's a very long. Yeah, it's a very long um, wing, so to keep the structure stable is quite difficult. So if there is any little turbulences, yeah, it, it will yeah, tend to, yeah. to get to yeah to get that little bit. So that's one thing. And also, what they tend to do is they tend when a bit goes because they're very long, they tend to wrap themselves around lines more, and that's what happens. They tend to cravat, and then you only have got half a wing flying on something which is already a bit unstable, and then it cascade very quickly. So, um, yeah. But they're getting better and better at making them safer and safer just because of, you know, advancing technology and simulation. And okay, so as you mentioned, um, for the parasitic, parasitic, parasitic drag, it's the other way around, is it um, increases with speed. And do you know by how much increases? Square. Yes, square. So if you increase your speed by two, you increase your drag by four. So if you don't fly, there's no drag. <laughs> and as you, as you accelerate, your parasitic drag increases as a parabolic curve. OK. 
Okay. So now we've got those two drags, aren't we? We just talked about. What do you think we're going to do with those two then? Yeah, we're going to combine them to see what happens to our aircraft when it flies through the air. Okay, so the total drag is the parasitic drag and the induced drag. And you put the two curves, parasitic, induced, sum them up, and you get your total drag. Is that okay? So far so good? What, what do you notice in there straight away? I mean, when I look at something like that, there's something that's pretty obvious to me. Yeah, where do, you be? Yeah, where do we want to be? Do we want to be here? No. no, really. Do you want to be there? No, I think we want to be at the bottom there, don't we? Where, where both uh, drags are at the minimum. And it nicely gives you a nice speed there, doesn't it? So when you get to that point where you got, you've minimized your two, um, your two drags together, this is your best glide. If you let go a little bit slower, it's not as efficient. If you go a bit faster, it's not as efficient because one drag or the other. So if you, if you start going slower, which drag is going to go up? Induced. And if you start to go a bit faster on that point, which one's going to take over? The parasitic. Yep, excellent. But at that point, both drivers are the same, and they are the minimum. And that gives you the speed for your best glide. OK? Does it tell me this on your area? It can. <laughs> it can. But you have, to have, uh, you have to have something that measures your speed. And you have to know the curve of the. Uh, you got to know a bit more of your, of your park glider. But in theory, in theory, you can do it. But it's so you know, if you got your hands there, you know, out or behind your risers, or if you're wearing a loose garment, or is it one of light crafting that's put your sleeves in, makes a difference. If you've got a streamlined harness, if you just got to sit up an harness. If you got big hair that day. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the forces. Okay. Um, so, let's talk about your glide angle. So, glide angle is the ratio between your lift and your drag. So, we, we know what our, um, our best lift is and then our best drag is from the previous figure. And that gives you a ratio, and that ratio gives you your glide. So in that case, oh, it's all given there. So <laughs> what's the glide? What's the, <laughs> the glide angle? Of the, what's the ratio of that part glide? <laughs> how do you? How do you? If, you get, if you're given a glide ratio of seven to one, what does that mean in real term? Well, it's all there, so you could at least read it and tell me back. <laughs> Will you drop 10 meters on your plan There you are. Excellent. Somebody can read the slides. Yes. But it's also your, the ratio between your lift and your drag. Yeah? So if you will I go okay, all the way up there. Then? Um, so if you got your lift over your drag, the ratio of that is the same than that ratio. Okay? That physical system is in balance. Are you not accelerating? You're not slowing down. You're not going up. You're not going slower or faster. Yeah? You're in balance. Like you're sitting there, all quiet, very quiet. <laughs> and what is made of? You got your weight. Yeah? That's pushing you down because, that's because of gravity. You're traveling through the air, which is shown by the airflow there. Okay, the wing is hitting that airflow. It's creating lift and it's creating drag. Okay, that's what we've talked about so far, isn't it? There's nothing new there. 
if you add those two together, have you added vector in, vectors in the past? Have you done that before, everybody? Yeah? If you add your vector together, you get the resultant, which is that. Yeah? So if you, that's the addition of those two. And what do you think that resultant must be equal to? Yes. Is that clear for everybody? Yeah? What happens if it's not equivalent to your weight? Yeah, if it's, uh, if it's bigger than your weight, then you'll be going up and you've got, you're really good. <laughs> you managed to do that with Park Lighter. I don't know how you do it, but <laughs> yeah. The, the wing, because it's a physical system, will always can't create energy, can't do that. So this will always happen, okay? And those angles, you, you're going to retrieve them. So you got your angle of attack there, but that angle of the airflow to the um, imaginary horizon, if you want, that's the equivalent of your glide angle. So that glide angle there is the same than that thing. So if you transpose that here, yeah? The angle there is the same than that one. Does that make sense? So the glide ratio is at its best when you're at right. best glide. Yeah. Yes. And when you speed up or slow down, your glide angle will deteriorate. Yes. Whatever you do, you accelerate or slow down, it will deteriorate. Yeah. That's in the. No yeah, that's is in no wind or constant wind. Yeah. Either constant wind or no wind. Um, so the term best glide is actually talking about best glide ratio, yeah? Um, yeah, you could, you, yeah, you can say the best glide. I mean, the glide is, is, that, is that performance you do, i.e. you drop 10 meters and you go 70, and the glide ratio is the, is the value of 7 to 1. So you can, you can use best glide, it's still, still okay. Um, I think in the exam, there is a question where they ask you, they give you values of like weight and drag and you get to find out the lift or something like that. However, you don't have to, you don't have to actually calculate anything because if you look at the value they give you, there's only one that will work in the sense that if you balance things out, like they give you, a, can you understand that the drag can never be bigger than the lift in that case? Or if your weight, if your weight increases, then your lift and your drag have to increase. Yeah. So if I, um, the things that it's so long since I've done that exam, I can't really remember. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure there's a, there's a, there's a question where they give you the the weight of the of the of the pilot and the wing, and then they they give you the lift and you got to calculate the drag. Something like that. But when you look at the value. There's only one that can, that can match because the others are really, either really big or really too small. Yeah, the, the ratio doesn't, just doesn't, doesn't add up, it just doesn't match. So you don't actually, you, you can do it. You can sit down and then do the, those, those diagrams, you know, put your weight here, put your lift there, and then you can get your drag and then measure it. It'll give you your drag. Yeah, so if you go a weight of 100 kilo there, so you put 100, so say 10 centimeters there, that will be, I don't know, nine and a half, and then if you draw those lines, then you can find what your drag is. You can do it, but you, you don't have to. Um, you don't have to do it. Um, can you see that if you, what happened to the drag if uh, your angle of ac your angle, uh, uh, your glide angle decreases? Yeah, the wall, the wall thing, get closer to that, uh, to that, that core, doesn't it? So it'll get like that. The lift will come up a bit like that, but the weight doesn't change. The weight is still the same. For this, yeah, the weight is still the same. So if the lift come a little bit closer to, to that line there, for the thing to stay in balance, the drag has to come down here, doesn't it? Make sense? I'm not, sure. I'm not sure. If you have got a better glide, so that, that angle there 
is like that. Yeah? That angle here will go down as well, won't it? Yeah? Everything being the same, i.e. the weight and the, the wing is the same, but your glide angle is better, yeah? That angle is going to go down like that, okay? Because those are perpendicular, it's going to go like that. Yeah? Okay? So, the, the weight and the resultant has to be the same, otherwise it's out of balance. So, your, that is still the same one, but that thing, that's, those two lines here have come closer to, to each other. So that here has gone up to about here now. So if you draw, if you draw your line like that, and then your 90 degree angle is going to come here, isn't it? So your drag has gone down by that much. No, you've just improved the you've just improved the glide. You've not changed. That's all you have done. Yeah. So it's just balanced. So I'm just. Exactly. If you have a better, if you reduce your drag, you got a better glide angle. Yeah. That, that's explained by that. If you reduce your glide angle for the same for the same physical system, if you reduce your glide angle, your drag will go down. Similarly, if you increase your weight there, if you increase your weight, what's going to happen? Okay, so if you increase your weight to here, so that, say, add that much, your drug's going to increase, okay, to here. And your lift going to increase, isn't it? Well spotted. Yeah? Both your drag and your lift going to increase. So is it going to change anything to your glide on goal then? Nope. It's not going to change anything. Because you're going to be going faster through the air. So you're going to reach you're going to reach at seventy meters faster, but you'll still reach it in ten meters. Up to a certain point when you start deforming the wing and <laughs> Yeah, does it make sense? So if you increase your weight, so if the weight is here now, which is the same than your resultant, we're here now. If we draw down to the drag, the drag is here. But if we draw to the lift, the lift is here now. So both of them have increased. So the whole system stays the same. The characteristics of the glide is the same. Sorry? Yeah, the, increase, the speed will increase, yes, the speed will increase, but the lift will increase and the drag will increase. So the glide on goal will stay the same. Yes, the parasite tag will increase, but because the lift is increasing as well, then you get, you get the, you, you, what you lose in increasing the, drag, the, the increase in the drag, you gain in increasing the lift. Yeah, so you don't, you fly, you fly faster, but you, f you don't fall as fast. Does that make sense? Because your lift has increased. So you go, you travel through there faster, but because your lift has increased, you don't fall as fast. So by the time you get to, to that point, you, you've done that, that little line, you've done it quicker, but you still reach that 70, 70, 70, 70 meter mark. It's a bit counterintuitive, but that's how it is. <laughs> that's how it is. Okay. I think it just repeats that. So if you increase the weight, the glider fast faster at the same glide angle, so the best glide is the same, and the sink rate increases. Okay. Next is polar curves. Have you done those? Have you read? Have you read about? Okay, good. No, but it's good. Yes, yeah, this, this is the time you want to ask the question, isn't it? Do you know what they represent? Okay. Uh, well, they, they're just uh, a plotting of the um, of the sink rate of the glider in relation to the speed of the glider. So. You just, that's the way they, they do it, they measure it. They've got, uh, they've got a vario with a speed probe. 
and they try to go to, I don't know, Monaco or Lodinese, where there's laminar air, and then they just fly, and they pull the brake on, and then they measure what the sink rate on the vario. They wait for it to be stabilized, because they don't want to go up and down, and they just measure the... Uh, those guys, those guys do it all the time, because it's much easier for them to measure that, because they got this, the speed is easier, easier, easier to measure. But they, they fly with the, they all know they are... Um, polar curve very well. All the aircraft will have polar curve by the manufacturer. Our aircraft is much harder to measure. And glider is easier because they can put the uh, speed probe on the A-frame. But for us it's very hard because there's a big difference between the wing and the pilot. Um, and because we are open to the elements, you know, the, as I say, the shape of the, pi the pilot makes a difference. Um, but that's all, that's all it is. It's just a plotting of your sink rate against the speed. Okay? That makes sense so far? Um, so if I tell you, can you tell me what's the sink rate for when you fly 20K? Yes, one. Sorry, what's your name? Pete. Pete. Does that make sense? If I want to know why, Okay, so as I said to you, the way, the way that, that is curved is that basically they measure it with the vario and they say, when I'm flying at 20, 20K, I've got a sink rate of one, and then you put the point, so sink rate of one, 20K, I put the point there. And then they do that all the way to 50K. 50K is about three, three something like that, three or two and a, two and a three quarter or something like that, okay? And then when you go to about uh, 12, yeah, then it could stop recording because for our, for our aircraft, we stall there. Yeah. But that's all they do. That's all they do. They put the points there, along there. So for you to retrieve an information, all you have to do is look at the graph and say, OK, can you tell me what speed is equivalent to a, a sync rate of 2? Yeah, just let just want P two. Forty. So how do you get it? How do you get to that then? Because I'm just. Well, you must have thought something, something, because you you come to a result. So. Because I'm just thinking, one is twenty. Yeah. So two is forty. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So you've not used the fact there is a curve there. No. Okay. So um, let's see if we can do that. It's going to be a bit small. So the question was, what's the uh, the speed of the glider for a sink rate of two? So should we start by two and see where we go? So if you draw a line from two and you hit that point there. Yeah, so that's that's your polar curve. Okay. That's the characteristic of your of your glider. Okay, and then if now you go up that way, yeah, yeah about thirty-eight. Do you mean okay. uh, how do you work it out? Oh, wow, how yeah. is that plotted? Yeah, how do you, you want to work it out without looking at that? You can't. You have to measure it. You have to measure. That's what I'm saying. Physically, yeah. you have to go into the aircraft, have a value that records all the points. So where did he get this polar curve from? Where did yeah, because the, somebody went into the aircraft with a value okay. and measured those those points. Okay. Physically, you have to do that. You have to go into the, the aircraft, use a value with a speedometer, and something to measure your speed because it's a, okay. it's a relationship between the speed and the, the sync rate. Okay. Your value of the sync rate if you add the, the speed probe. And all you have to do all you have to do is physically say, okay, I'm flying at 20k. What's my sync rate? Oh, it's one. One point here now. Yeah. Okay? You wanted an equation to be able to work it out. Yeah, exactly. There is no equation. It's also yeah. worth mentioning is all the shape of the polar curve is different for all paragliders. So you don't know in advance. You have to build a paraglider, yeah. fly it, and then measure it. You can, you can, you can, the, the manufacturer will know the, the wing, the polar curve of the wing. However, when you add the pilot, because every part is different shape, and the harness is different, yeah. then it will be different. 
For those guys, it's easy because all the pilot fits in there, right. which inside the box, so there's nothing sticking out. Yeah, yeah. So the manufacturers know exactly what the polar curve because they get it to the computer and with the, you know, the characteristic of the wing, the weight of the aircraft, everything, the drag, then they can get to that polar curve. But they'll still go into the air and then measure it like that as well. Okay. Yeah? Good? Good. You there? Okay. So from the polar curve, we can extrapolate a few things. One thing we can retrieve is the best glide. Where is the... Mm. Okay. To get your best glide in still air, so there's n either the air is the same, it doesn't move, or uh, there's no air, the same thing. What is your best glide? So what you do is you start from the, uh, the, the speed of the air, which in that case is zero, and you draw, you draw a tangent. You know tangent? So it's the, it's the line that will just touch the minimum possible that curve there. Are we okay with that? I know that's what you do, but I don't know why it works, to be honest. Why it works? Yeah. Um, I don't know why that defines best glide. Um, let me well, think without going into the math. So uh, because that's the... Um, that's that's the sm you can, that has the smallest... The smallest, yeah. I mean, you can, you can, what you can do is you can calculate the, you can calculate the, um, how do you call it, the, um, the tangent. Uh, bear with me because I've got the names, in, all those maths, I've learned them in French, so. <laughs> um, that, the, ang the angle that uh, the, that uh, line is making with, with that curve, it's got a name, I can't remember what it is, but uh, for each point of the, each point of the line, you can calculate it. And the minimum, the smallest one, will be that one. Okay. Yeah? The other way to think about it as well is for every point, there's a, you can divide the speed by the sync rate. So, for instance, for, for 20, 20 divided by 1 is... That's your ratio. 10, but 28 divided by 1.2 is bigger. So it's, you can try to make that number as big as possible. The, div the division that he's doing is actually doing that to that to that line okay. yeah and that's what that's why you want to get your to get your minimum one you want that one which where the the different the difference between that line and that that curve and that line is the smallest and because we're in still air you want to be starting your line to hit the zero point okay so if you if you draw that line, then it gives you your best ratio between your your speed and your sync rate, which is 20, 25, 25, no 27, 27, 27 and a half. <laughs> if now the so that's in still air now, if now you got headwind. What happens to the to the polar curve? It will, yeah, it'll. So if you if you um, if you now got a headwind, okay, in that case is the headwind is twenty k, yeah. So now you use the same rule you've used before. But you start from 20k and you try to minimize the uh, the angle between that curve and that uh, and that line. You just hit the the end of the line really there. <laughs> it's borderline, isn't it? So if you are headwind, your best glide now is uh, this by here, isn't it? So if you go headwind of 20, you got to fly at uh, 47. That's your, yeah. 
Yeah, we never talk about ground speed because it's relevant for the flying aircraft. It's only relevant when you hit the planet, <laughs> as my knee can uh, witness. Uh, <laughs> um, but obviously, the sync rate is now increased as well. There. So knowing that, if you've got a tailwind now, what do you think is going to happen? Where do you think that curve is going to go? That that line, where do you think is going to go? Yeah, to the left. Yeah. So if you go to 20, 20k tailwind, you can now go to fire fly at twenty two K, something like that. Yeah. So twenty 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 K tailwind gives you about 22k flying speed. And what, what sync rate does that give you about? About one, one and something for that polar curve. So far? Okay-ish? Okay. So, wait. so you can fly, we can fly in headwind, tailwind, and then where else as well does the air does do to us? Uh, yeah, let's not. Yeah, the, yes, the main one is going up and down, isn't it? So, if we fly, if we if we fly in sinking air, we don't use the uh, horizontal axis anymore. We're going to use the vertical axis, which is the uh, vertical speed. Okay. So if you sink at one meter per second, so well, so if you're flying in sinking air at one meter per second. Your best glide is at what speed? 45. Yeah, 45. That's with no wind then. Yeah, that's with no wind. OK, good question. If you were fl flying in sinking air, sinking air, why well, there's no H in front, sinking air of one meter per second with a 10k tailwind, where would you point your line? Give me numbers. It'd be the same as nothing. It'd be like zero. Ten. 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 Yes. You'll start your curve from there, which, yes, you're right. It'll be the same than zero, more or less. But you'll draw your line from here. Yep. And then it'll go. Yeah, it's more or less the same than it was from when it's zero, isn't it? Roughly the same. Unable to connect to box. Yeah, no, I've got no internet access. You sure you want to exit box? Yes, thank you. Oh, actually, this is on the next one anyway. <laughs> so this is the other one. If you're in sinking hair and you got a headwind, so we've got a headwind of um, 15 there and the sinking air of one meter per second. We're doing to fly. What speed? speed. 40, bar. 40, uh, yeah, full bar. <laughs> But this is important because you don't real, you know, you can. You have to if you want to fly op optimal, uh, 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 an optimum manner. You have to do that. You have to speed up. If you're sinking, you can put your accelerator on. Yeah. If you're sinking in a lot of, if you're in a big sink, if you're in two and a half, three, three, four, four meters per second, put your accelerator on. Don't do it too close to the ground, please, and be aware that. If it's sinking that much, you might hit some turbulences when you come out of the sinking air. So you might want to release the, the accelerator. But when you do active flying, that's what you should be doing. You know, if, you, if, you're, if, you're going, if, you, if you're starting to feel the wind in your face, you know you're heading headwind, hands up, a bit of accelerator. If you're slowing down, then off the accelerator and a little bit of brake. Same thing in sinking air and sinking air and rising air. So I know it's all theory. But it is. It does. It should impact the way you fly. Yeah. Do paragliders fly with airspeed indicators? No. no. Well, you can, but they're not very good because you got to have them dangling, because they there's nowhere to hang them <laughs> somewhere. Yeah. 
But you, you can have probes dangling down, but they've got a bit of inertia because they tend to fly underneath. They've got to, fly under, they've got to be underneath your feet, really. And because they're on a the line... So this is all a bit theoretical. It's, it, yeah, it is theoretical. Well, but I'm, it is... But you don't, you, don't, you don't need the airspeed indicator, you just need to know, oh, well, I'm, at least for sinking air, you know what it is, yes. isn't it? So you know your base glide is usually, each glider is slightly different. Some, some gliders, the base glide is when you've got a bit of accelerator, some are just when they end up. So mid-range mid -range power glider will tend to be end up, and that's your base glide. As you go up into categories, sometimes they will need a bit of accelerator. So that's your base glide. Are you going to, if you're going to sinking air, well, you know you got to accelerate. Yeah. So if you've already got your hands up here, then you've got to put a bit of power, okay? And then if you start to go into a, a thermal, then it's the other way around. If that's your best glide, then slow your glider a bit, and then you'll get a better, sink, a bigger, a better, better glide. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. if you hands off the uh, if you off the off and off the uh, the A-frame, what's the is that the uh, is that best glide? Do you have to have a bit of bar bar in? Okay, yeah. So that I'm not having to push out hard when I'm turning, basically. Yeah. Okay. So you've put your anchor, uh, your anchor point at the back. Okay. Um, so what's special about that point here? I've already talked about it, but I need to... So when you stall. Yeah. So when you stall. And this is related to the speed because we don't have any power. So the only way, there's nothing to push us. So for our craft, there is a relationship between the angle of attack and the speed at which we fly. Okay? Because as you, as you slow down, you've got to create more angle of attack to compensate the loss of speed. Yes, the airflow over the, uh, the wing is not going as fast, so it doesn't create as much lift. So to compensate for that, we've got to in increase the angle of attack, and to, because we're slowing down, the wing does that, 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 as we slow down, as we slow down, as we slow down, and then you pass point where all the airflow comes off, and it's that point, and we fall out of the sky. Has anybody done it? Mm -hmm. SIV, anybody? SIV, yeah. yeah. I've done it in all of the knees. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it does get messy, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, that's your stall. Uh, next, let's talk about stability. Three kind of stability: unstable, neutrally stable, and stable. So something that's unstable, one is in uh, in balance, and you just touch it a tiny little bit because of balance becomes whatever whatever system physical system is it'll come off and never come back to his original position and usually you just need a little bit of energy to do that tiny little bit and it just go off not really stable you need more energy but it will uh, it will just continuously be unstable it won't accelerate the instability this one will just accelerate 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 this one will just if there is no drag or anything like that it'll just keep going and this one, this is one we like. It's hard to get it out of this position, and if you don't put any energy in it, it'll come back down to the uh, position of um, at which it started. Okay. How do you think our power gliders are? Are they unstable, naturally stable, or stable? Yeah, they're super stable actually. Very stable thing compared to uh, an aircraft. They're very stable, even compared to a hand glider, very stable. Because there's such a massive pendulum effect, they always come back in position. If you just let go of everything, 
they fly very well now on if you ask uh, Duncan I can witness because he flew his paraglider with broken neck and conscious and his paraglider flew very well even though he wasn't flying it <laughs> um, so you get the stability in the three axes so you got uh, the pitch which one's the pitch? yeah okay um, so for us, yeah, it's the pendulum effect. So when the glider goes down, it comes back up because we're so heavy compared to the um, the wing, and so far down. Roll. Yep, that's the roll. Same thing. And then the yo. Yeah. So the yo for us is not done by the weight. Yeah. It's done by the shape of the wing. If you are a normal aircraft like this one, and you don't have something dangling down there and weighing about 100 kilos, you can achieve stability by uh, the way you design your wing. Um, so that if the, if, the, if the aircraft starts going backwards, you can make it so that, um, yeah, sorry, it's the other way around. It's been a while since I've done that one. Uh, if the wing just on its own, if it's got no, um, no aircraft attached to it, and it's flying through the air, and there's a tiny little change of angle of attack, so say it's an increase, then the uh, center of pressure is going to go forwards, and because it goes forwards, that's going to pull the wing even more, and because it moves forwards, it's going to pull the wing even more, and then it'll just stall and fall out of the sky. So the wing just on its own is unstable, <coughs> on our, on our uh, aircraft, because we are a big lump of uh, flesh at the bottom, then there's this pendulum effect. So if the, uh, if the angle of attack changes and the center of pressure moves forwards, the weight of the pilot will bring things back as it were at the beginning and bring the center of pressure back slightly at the back. So. If you go a normal aircraft, then you got the uh, horizontal surface at the back. Okay, like that. But if you are um, a delta wing, and for the hang gliders, you don't have the back surface. So, how do you do it? Well, you have a little bit of pendulum effect because the pilot is still hanging down by about that much. Yeah. yeah hanging down, so there is a little bit of effect, um, effect, but what you tend to do is you tend to create um, washout, so you can create like a curve at the back of the wing, so that's when the, uh, well it's hard to do with that one because there isn't one, but imagine you got something that wash out like that, so when the wing starts to uh, increase the angle of attack, that washout effect will tend to bring it back down forward, okay. I shall swept the wing, makes it also nice. Okay. So the, sun, the, uh, the tip will um, stall before, and then we'll bring the ladder back down. What you can do, you can have, you can make, you can make your airfoil, you can design the profile of your airfoil, so it's got a bit of reflex in it, so it will naturally be a bit, a bit more um, stable by bringing the trailing edge out. Uh, on the hang glider, they, you play with these things, they pull the lines a bit more, a bit less, depending if they want more, more performance or less stability. And, but there's a trade-off, obviously. If you have got more performance, you've got less washout, less reflex, and then you've got less stability. That's what they do in competition, isn't it? They just make their Wash out line a bit longer. <laughs> and then they fall out of the sky <laughs> when they're at the top of the, uh, the thermal and suddenly things start barreling over. Um, okay, so the roll, well, against forest is easy because we've got such a big weight at the bottom that again it brings back the, uh, 
to equilibrium just with the weight of the, the paraglider, the paraglider pilot. On an aircraft, what you can do is you can use the, um, the angle that the uh, wing makes with the, with the aircraft, because all, may, most of the weight of the aircraft will be in the middle of the aircraft. So if you if you got the um, dihedral, like that, so the angle is like that. You can see that if the weight is here, that's fairly stable. It's back to that figure we showed at the bottom at the beginning. So, sorry. Yeah, same thing than that. If you got the di dihedral di wing, if your wings are like that, then it's very stable. If your wings are like this, then it's very unstable. Yeah. So I suspect an uh, airliner will be like that, and an acro plane will be like that. The mark should be neutral because then it got the same behavior upside down. And for the hung glider, they use the uh, the sw the um, the swept wings, or some some have got anhydral as well, aren't they? They, can, they have got a certain ratio of dihedral and anhydral you can you can put on it. I suspect the planks, you know, the uh, the planks, the flies, the um, rigid ones, they'll definitely have some kind of dihedral or anhydral. They'll be dihedral because they're already quite unstable anyway. Okay, the the yo is done by um, by the by the fact that uh, on a on a delta wing, oh, it's there, so might as well use that one, because you got uh, because you got an angle between the two wings. When you change the yo, you change the amount of exposure to the uh, the incoming wind airflow. Sorry, and that tends to naturally bring back the wing back into uh, into shape. This one will create a bit more drag than this one, and I'll just bring it back into, into shape. So if you go a very flat hung glider like that, I suspect the yo stability will be really rubbish. Whereas if you had a bit of a, an angle delta wing, it'll be a lot better. For the paraglider, the same thing really. Um, you end up having um, you end up having a difference between your drag and your, li and your lift. Again, if you take the middle of your wing, swept anyway, the system will come, try to come back um, in line. So if you have the uh, center of gravity, uh, center of the lift slightly at the front of the center of the drag, um, and your uh, center of gravity should be in the middle there, if you change those two, they're going to try to bring them back in line naturally. So by Carefully positioning your, that's what the manufacturer does, that's their cleverness. By carefully uh, positioning the center of uh, lift and the center of drag, carefully, then you, you increase or you decrease your, um, your, your stability. If, they are, if the center of lift and center of drag are on the same point, then it'll be very unstable. So if you start doing that, then you'll keep doing that. There will be nothing to bring it back in. Whereas if the drag and the center of lift are far away from each other, then that forces, that fulcrum effect will be more important. And it will it'll be harder to, yaw, to, make, to make it yaw, but when it's in a yaw, it'll tend to bring it back as well. You can also use the fin effect. So if you take one of those, yeah, that's just resistance to, uh, to your yaw. If you try to turn it like that, there's this big surface there. With us, power glider is the shape, the fact that it's curved, yeah, it's shaped, it's shaped as, a, as a curve, so you got this fin effect. If you look at that, yeah, the fact that it's that shape makes it harder to, to, tur to, um, to turn. Now it's a bit, the way power gliders turn is very, it's very complicated because it's a mix of the U and the roll. Um, which is created by a mix of uh, lift and drag. So it's not like, yeah, I think, I don't know, uh, in the latest edition of the, 
unbooked pilot, but did he say he still turned like a tank? I.e. you pull one side, he creates dragon and makes you turn. Is that what he says in the pilot handbook? I've not read it for a while. I don't think it does, no. Because that's what he used to say. But I had massive arguments with Mark Dale uh, about that, because that's not how they work. It's partly how it works. But can you imagine how inefficient it would be if that was the case? You put a, you put a bit of brake, that creates drags, and that makes it turn, because that's slower. Which is partly true, but what it does is actually create lift as well on, the, on that side, and it's that lift that makes the paraglider, paraglider turn. You can talk about it after a few. <laughs> okay for the stability? Yeah? I think that's the last few slides after that, isn't it? It's the um, instrument, I think. Okay. That's the bit on the instrument now. Pressure. What creates the pressure on Earth? Yes. The massive weight, yeah, there's this atmosphere above our head, weighs a massive amount. And that's what creates the uh, the pressure on Earth. Um, obviously, you got when you're at the bottom there where we are, because we've got all that column of air on top of us. That's the highest point where <laughs> the pressure is the highest. As you go up, the pressure decreases. Okay. Um, when you're near the ground, I, when you're not here in that bit there, when you're in that bit there, it's roughly <laughs> one millibar every thirty feet. So you lose one millibar of pre pressure every 30 feet, it's about every 10 meters, be less than every 10 meters. That's a rough, rough thing. So, can we use that for our advantage? Yes, we can. Um, because the barometric pressure, the air pressure, exerts its weight on all surfaces on Earth and body is exposed to it, we can use it to measure the pressure and that will tell us how high we are. And that's an altimeter. Yeah. So one way you can do it is you create a, a vacuum, and then you attach a little attach a little rod to the vacuum. That's a flexible vacuum vessel, and that needle is attached to um, a gauge. So what do you think is going to happen if you go up in altitude to that vacuum there? That, that vessel that where the vacuum is, if it's slightly flexible. Expand. Yes, it's going to expand. And when you go back down, it's going to uh, contract. And that allows you, that's the old, how the old altimeter used to work. So it's very good, very easy, um, but it's very slow. And that doesn't, that only indicates you the altitude you are at, but it doesn't tell you if you're going up or if you're going down. So one way you can change, tweak that slightly to know if you're going up or down, is if you put a little valve in there, a little hole, yep. And that will, when the air comes out, that will allow you to tell you if you're going up or if you're going down. Because if you are, if you are stable, the pressure is stable, there's obviously a motor that creates a vacuum, and the air, the air is coming in. When you go, when you go up, the rate of which the air is going um, in is going to slow down, isn't it? So it's going to deform less than it should. So by measuring that, you can say whether or not you're going up and down. But obviously, because that doesn't deform very much, it's very uh, inefficient. It's a very slow, very not very sensitive instrument. But that's where the first the first way they used to measure uh, vertical speed. So I have a small leak and then uh, measure how it deforms. Yeah. But doesn't the vacuum just disperse? No, that's, that's why there's, there's a pump and there's a pump that keeps uh, the vacuum. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, otherwise it would be, poof, it's yeah. gone. But there's a pump. <laughs> Sorry? A pelling vario. A pelling vario. A pellet. Oh, pellet. Yeah, this next one is that one. That, that one. Did you get that one? Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very good. Um, 
So what you do is you measure the airflow coming out of that void. So you measure it directly into the, uh, into the airflow. Yeah. So, but you need to have this big flask. What did you use to, did it come with an electric pump on it as no, well? it's just a, just a basic flask with a pallet on the front of it in case of a plastic thing. It just works on air. Okay. Oh yeah, I suspect one is stable again, isn't it? Once you've reached, once you've stopped, stopped moving, it stabilizes again. And then as you start moving again, then the air flow comes in and out. Yeah. It's supposed to be good, were they good? It was, um, I mean, it was an early version. Yeah. You think, oh, I'm going up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just a gauge, isn't it? Um, so nowadays we use electronic <laughs> alti 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 altivariometers um, and what you have is uh, you've got this piece of silicone, you've got a bit of vacuum and then this uh, piezoelectric um, uh, material on top of it and when the, uh, when the vacuum changes it deforms the material and the material either um, the resistance will change or it will create a little bit of electricity, depends what kind of material they use. Um, and that's measured by some electronics that then can display. All good for that? Okay, so the next ones are the one you were talking about earlier on. So if we have, um, you know when, you, when you're flying, you've all done that until you're flying and then you apply brakes and what does your vario do when you do that? Yes, if you, you go, did, 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 don't you? But you actually go up. Do you actually go up into rising air? No. You're transforming the energy you add, which is your speed, into height. So you've not gained anything. You've not gained any energy. You're not gaining, you're not gaining any height, in actual fact, because you, that height, you're going to lose it again straight away. So what you can do is if you measure your speed at the same time, then you can compensate for that. Yeah. So if you've got a speed probe, the speed probe will notice that when you're going up, you're also slowing down, but you, which means you've not gained any energy. If you keep the same speed and you're going up, yes, you gain energy. Yeah? But for that, you need the, uh, you need the um, a speed, air speed probe, which again on paragliders, just no good. Uh, on glider, you can put them to the the A-frame. Okay, so next is the MacReady ring. Does anybody use that thing again still? I thought, you know, to be honest, I thought they'd remove them from the exam, but I think it's still in there. Um, Anglider pilots used to use them, but I don't think they bother anymore. Uh, those guys do. They still use them. Um, what it does is allow you to, um, to show the best speed to fly for best glide, lift or sink, uh, with the average of the, um, the, the, the climbing rates you've had so far. So, um, if you've been, what you do is you, with the ring there, you set, you turn it, you set to the, um, to the thermal, the climbing rate of the thermal you've had during the day, well, the few, few minutes you've been flying, and it will tell you What's the best um, best speed you have to uh, to fly when you're sinking or when you're rising? So that that bit we were doing. Yeah, you know that bit we are doing there. It allows you to average the average. If you give it the average of the 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 rising air, so this one. Where is it gone? Yeah, it doesn't have it. Yeah, it doesn't have it. But, so, if you give it the average of your rising air, then it will tell you what speed you need to fly when you sink or when you climb for the day. But nobody uses them anymore. I mean, we all, if you use a, a value with a GPS um, and um, several altimeters, the value will, will tell you what to do. Slides are a little bit, I need to change the orders, don't I? Um, so the 
Your basic, vari basic value just tells you if you're going up and down. The total energy, i.e. the one that measures the, the speed at the same time, tells you uh, the vertical movement of the aircraft, irrespective, well, taking into account the, uh, the speed, i.e. the energy. And then the air mass, it will tell you the vertical movement of the aircraft is flying into the air mass. So if the air mass is going up, the, the air mass value will tell you if you're going up or down in that air mass. Because when we, when we go through an air mass, we're still falling at one point, whatever, 1.1, 1.2 meter per second. So when you're going up, if, the, if you're going up by 2 meters per second, in actual fact, the air mass is going up by uh, 3.2 or something like that, isn't it? Yeah? So your value doesn't tell you at what rate you're going up and down in that air mass that's going up. The air mass value does that. Okay. So, so in a practical way, if we were just flying along and you bump into a thermal, and then you've been thermaling for a minute, and the average is two meters a second, what's actually happening is it's a three meter a second thermal where you're falling at one meter a second, yeah. and you read two. Yeah. Okay. So that the air mass barrier would read three. It, it will tell you. Yes, it will read three. Yeah. The real movement of the air mass, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So just to recap a few of the terms we've seen. Aspect ratio is the ratio of the wing span to the cord. High aspect ratio, the wing is uh, thin and long. Um, it's also the pan square divided by surface, yeah. The square, yeah. The span divided by the surface area. So span. It's the span divided by surface area. Yeah? Very difficult to measure on a paraglider because what surface area do you take into account? If you do you do that surface area, or do you do the projected surface area? It's easy on one of those because it's more or less the same. But on one of ours, there's a big difference because of the curved shape of the paraglider between the uh, projected surface area and the surface area of the wing. And you might see it actually in the technical specification. They give you the uh, projected area and the aspect ratio they should tell you if it's a, the aspect ratio is done on the projected area or on a real, um, because you could have um, it could be misleading. Um, you could have like a really like curved paraglider like that. So if you take the surface area, it could be massive, but the projected surface area will be quite small. So to fly, you'll be a right pig because if it falls, there'll be a massive bit of cloth that will go all over the place uh, and the performance won't be very good. So you could read the thing thinking, oh, the aspect ratio is quite small, be quite safe, but in actual fact it wouldn't, it wouldn't be if they used the projected area. Okay, the cord, the distance of the airfoil from the um, leading edge to the trailing edge. It's that line we talked about. The angle of attack, uh, measure the angle of the airflow to the cord. The hydral, it's the flush like that of the wing. And hydral, the other around, downward. Center of pressure here is where all the pressure created by the wing are uh, are concentrated, so be somewhere there for that wing. The washout is the uh, the wing tip that reflects up like that. The glide angle or ratio is the efficiency of the uh, of the the, um, the aircraft of the wing. So the smaller the angle, the best the better the glide. The higher the ratio, the better the line. Minimum sink, speed at which the 
the aircraft fly the slowest. Relative wind. Oh, yeah, we've not done that, haven't we? Not much to talk about relative wind. Where would that be then? Hmm, it's funny he's not there. It's just that ball that I got the other. Yeah. Um sorry. Yeah, it's the airflow, isn't it? The apparent wind as the glider is flying. Yeah, it'll be the airflow. Okay. Right. Are you all falling asleep now? You are quite smiling to start with, but now everybody's <laughs> like. Have you got any questions? I've got some little diagrams to show you, actually. They're quite funky. Da, da, da. Okay, so that to sh that, what does that show you then? Yeah, so that shows you how the air gets accelerated at the top and how it gets slowed down at the bottom by the airfoil. Yeah? Okay, I've got another one. Just bear with me. So that's the pressure. That's the the air. That's the air, the air, um, the airlines. If you imagine, you know, straight air, straight airlines, and how they get deformed by the wing going through through it. It's not brilliant that one. I've got one with pressure somewhere. Oh yeah, this one is good actually. This one shows you the pressure created by the wing depending on the angle of attack. So when it's blue is the highest pressure and when it's red, so the lowest pressure, sorry. Blue is low pressure, red is high pressure. So you can see when the, uh, the angle of attack is so slow, so small, then it actually creates dep uh, depression at the front of the wing. When we get to that level, just there, look, start creating big, dip, dip, uh, low pressure. And then there is this one, which shows you the force. Sorry. So that's that to show you the forces created by the the wing, and can you see how it kind of match the um, the creation of the uh, low pressure on the other on that other one? So if I just drag, where's the other one? Uh, can you see how oh, it matches more? It, it matches the, the low pressure quite well. And also, you can see how the high pressure doesn't create anything like the low pressure. Can you see how huge they are? But look at the size of the. Those, those are the forces created by the high pressure under the wing. Can you see them there? Can you see the size of them compared to the. Uh, 
the high pressure one, and nothing, and nothing like it. So they say one third, two third, but when you get to that really high, when you get to that really high angle of attack, it's more, definitely more than one, one to three. I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's all I have. That's it. Any questions? So do you want to know how a paraglider turns? You don't have to say yes. If you don't want to know, I'm not telling you, but it's quite interesting. Because um, it's very counterintuitive. So the guy who designed them is brilliant because it's, it's counterintuitive. Okay. This is a better one than that. Okay, this one. So, the first way is how you you think. So, if you pull if you pull your your right toggle, you create a flap that creates drag, doesn't it? So, by doing that, you slow down that wing, okay, and then you get some yo, which will make you turn. That's really really inefficient. And the other thing you do, you create lift, don't you? When you pull your when you pull your, your brakes down, you create some lift, like you do with one of those. If you bring that down, that's how it turns. This one, those, a plane doesn't turn by creating drag, it doesn't do that, and then it drags and turns like that. It does that, that creates lift, and that makes, turn, makes the plane turn, doesn't it? Paraglider is no different. When you pull your flap down, you create some lift. So, normally, your center of pressure and your forces are here. If you bring your flap down here, that wing is going to create more lift, that, wing, that half wing. So your force is going to move down here, aren't they? But you'll think, if that's happened, then it should be turning the other way. Yeah, so I should be, if I bring, the, uh, if I bring my, my right brake down and the forces go to that side, then that side is going to lift and I'll turn left. But what you don't realize is that you've got the weight of the pilot right at the bottom, and it's all to do with the center of gravity, because all those forces only apply to the center of gravity. Okay? So, you've got your, center, you've got your, your forces there, and you've got the center of gravity here. You move that here, and what happens is that that force will go through the lines, will go down, either through the pilot, to the left of the pilot or to the right of the pilot. And that's where the, the force is applied. It's not on the wing, it's on the center of gravity. So, if the force is applied here, then you're going to turn that way. Makes sense. If the line is designed a certain way, that when the, uh, the force is moved down and follows the line, and it's all to do with the curve, how much there is curve, and how long the lines are. Yeah? If, you, if the pilot, imagine the pilot is here, okay? And you put like a little vector here, it's going to be like that, isn't it? And that's going to carry to that fulcrum effect here, that lever effect here, and I will, all the aircraft are going to shift that way, and it will turn right. And that's all to do, that's why when you've got a very flat paraglider, it's very hard to turn. Yeah? Because you don't have this effect, you don't have this effect of having the lever on the side of the pilot. So it's a mixture of two, but the most, most of the effect is down to that one. You create the lift, and the lift is applied to the center of gravity, but it's not through the pilot. If it's through the pilot, nothing will happen, it won't turn. Yeah? If it's to the uh, right of the pilot, then it'll turn left. But because it's the left of the pilot, then you turn right. Yeah, you put in your you put in yourself away from the uh, from that force, so you increase the the effect of that uh, lever. There you are. You know the paraglider turns. <laughs> there is actually an article somewhere. Still got it, with all the calculations shows the different um, ratio by designer. There you are.
Any more questions? So in the exam, there's, you don't really need to do any calculations, you know, with all those forces and all that. It's all to do with, like, understanding that if the drag increases, then the lift has to increase if it's stable, um, and things like that. Yeah? And is the, the figure will make, will make sense. If you look at them carefully, you'll think, ah, this is just crazy. That answer is just crazy. That one's crazy. So the only one that can be done is that one. Or you can go with your ruler and then draw them. <laughs> you can choose. I don't know which one I'll go for. Okay?